Coming up, we visit with Magizi Communications and the National Indian Education Association. We're talking native health and even rock and roll with Stevie Salas. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian country today. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. is Indian Country Today. Amarawa Hopa, thank you for joining us for this Friday edition of Indian Country Today. I'm Alia Chavez. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is announcing $1.5 million in tribal tourism grants. The money will be given to tribes as well as organizations serving Native Americans and Native Hawaiians. The funds are being awarded under the Tribal Tourism Grants Program. This is a competitive, discretionary program administered by the Office of Indian Economic Development. Proposals are evaluated on a variety of activities related to tourism that are aimed at stimulating economic growth within a tribal community. During this round, applications could also explore how a tribal tourism business could recover and adapt to COVID-19 challenges. Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs Brian Newland says the program is one way to help tribal governments and organizations stay open for business. The U.S. Interior and Agriculture Departments are announcing actions to protect Minnesota's boundary waters and the surrounding watershed. The area in the northeastern part of the state brings in nearly $100 million annually to the local recreation economy. It is considered a unique natural wonder. The Biden administration is committing itself to complete a study of potential impacts of mining near the pristine watershed, and it comes in response to concerns for potential impacts of mining on fish, wildlife, trust with tribal nations, and treaty rights. The administration is considering a 20-year withdrawal of key portions of the national forest lands from disposition under the mineral and geothermal leasing laws. Currently, the agencies are temporarily prohibiting new mineral leasing until the study is complete. A new project is aiming to preserve the cultural history of one Arizona tribe. Near the Arizona-Nevada border, more than 700 petroglyphs can be found at Grapevine Canyon. The images were carved into the canyon rocks sometime between 1100 and 1900 A.D. These rock engravings are a reminder that the region's history extends long before first points of contact with settlers. The Fort Mojave Indian tribe once occupied the lands stretching from Utah to Mexico and east to west from modern-day Santa Barbara to Prescott, and their tribal territory follows alongside the Colorado River, which is sacred to its traditions. The tribe is working to establish the Avi Kwa Ame National Monument, which will protect 380,000 acres of public land in southern Nevada if the proposal is granted. Indigenous people in Peru are demanding the government play a part in helping to protect their lands. More than 50 indigenous tribal leaders from the Peruvian Amazon protested in Lima. They are demanding the government continue a project to legalize their ancestral lands. The project would prevent the encroachment of illegal coca leaf growers in their communities. The demonstrators say they fear if illegal activities continue, many of their people may be killed. While our brethren are killed, illegal activities are violating indigenous territories. This is our concern, and that is why we want to call the government to us to tend to our urgent demands. 
an independent collective of human rights organizations has documented at least 17 murders believed to be linked to illegal logging and drug trafficking groups. The newest season of This Land podcast is digging into the Indian Child Welfare Act. The opening scene of the podcast's second season describes a trip to one of the most infamous Indian boarding schools in the country. The school, commonly known as Carlisle, was created by Colonel Henry Pratt. His infamous and terrible phrase, kill the Indian, save the man, defined what the Indian boarding school era was places to erase native identity. Cherokee citizen and podcast host Rebecca Nagel says this kind of native erasure is alive and well, including in a court case that may soon be in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Nagel says custody cases involving native children, like Brakeen versus Holland, are now being used to attack indigenous rights. In terms of the significance of the podcast, for me, it's really the significance of this case, Brackeen v. Holland. You know, if you care about Indigenous rights in the United States, if you're interested in Indigenous rights in the United States, you need to be following this case. New episodes of This Land can be found every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Coming up, the state of Indian education, health research, and let's rock and roll with Stevie Salas. This is Indian Country Today. McGeezy Communications has been a pillar of the Minneapolis urban Indian community since 1977. Through the decades, it has served thousands of youth with opportunities to advance their knowledge in the media and beyond. It bought and renovated a building on Lake Street, and less than a year later, it was gone. Let's watch this video by David Conoyer. Just down the sidewalk from still smoking embers, there's smudge and prayer for a Minneapolis nonprofit organization serving Native American youth. This nonprofit has served indigenous youth for over 40 years. We're responding to a legacy. The home of the nonprofit called McGeezy was burned on the third night of destructive protests following the death of George Floyd while in custody by Minneapolis police. With widespread looting and vandalism in the city, members of the American Indian movement had stood watch. For the first night, AIM was here trying to protect McGeezy from being vandalized. And the night before, uh, it was not touched. That protection worked, but late night flames still apparently jumped from nearby buildings. Watching the destruction of McGizzy, an institution that has been the foundation for organizing, for education, for opportunity, for building community together, is no longer there. We did not do that. We have been coming together to take care of our community. McGeezy CEO Kelly Drummer is sad, if not angry, but she isn't pointing fingers. That night, this whole city block was in chaos. McGeezy youth are in disbelief. Yeah, it just it just helped all of us. What do you think about what you see? McGeezy had just moved into its new home in 2019 after raising $1.6 million to buy and renovate the space. And that's what's really hard to see this go because this was our design building and how we wanted it to be for our youth. The first full day after the tragedy brought out an army of volunteers wanting to help. Amazing. They wanted to find a way to help and, you know, Miggy being an innocent bystander and all of this. Megizi means eagle in the Ojibwe language, and many friends already are helping the Native youth group raise money to rebuild and soar once again. The building is gone. The spirit of the eagle remains here. Kelly Drummer joins us today. She's Oglala and Megizi's executive director. I asked her where the organization is now. Well, we are in a temporary space where I'm at uh, today on uh, 32nd Street, so about a block from our previous building. And we're operating programs out of this location and the Minneapolis American Indian Center is where our Green Jobs location is 
is located now. And um, then we also work out of the University of Minnesota for some of our first person productions programming. It's been over a year since the fire. How is the community healing? Well, on May 28th, we held a memorial walk um, a year after the fire. And that was a really healing experience from moving from our previous land to our new building, which is at 1845 East Lake Street. So literally about two blocks down from our previous site. And the excitement is really building around our new building and where we're going to be headed. Uh, we're looking for uh, the building to be a net zero green building. And so we're in a $5.2 million capital campaign to help us reach those goals. How are the students doing? Youth have really, really taken a hold of what has happened, not only uh, to our organization, but in, in our community. And they've been establishing, um, you know, there's been a walk for missing and murdered indigenous women, um, there was just a boarding school walk the end of September. Um, the walk that we held in, in, in the end of May, really engaging kids in the social justice issues um, that are occurring in our community and, and what, how can they be a part of it and how can they lead efforts for change. And so we've been really working hard uh, to facilitate those feelings and how do you express those in art and in communications, many of our youth worked on COVID messaging throughout the summer and the importance of getting vaccinated. They created a uh, theme of herd immunity. And so there's a billboard on Lake Street um, with um, how uh, bison and the herd, herd immunity is essential to um, ending the pandemic. So we have billboards across Lake Street and our youth actually um, created that design and it's being used really across the state. That was Kelly Drummer, McGeezy's Executive Director in Minneapolis. The National Indian Education Association convened in Omaha, Nebraska. ICT's Shirley Snavy has this report. 800 students and educators returned to an in-person conference to learn and reconnect. Student Days brought 200 youth together for inspiration and skills building workshops led by Frank Wan and Chance Rush. We've had a great past two days. Uh, grateful to be here to just encourage our, our young adults to, you know, take on the responsibility to be one of a kind, to uh, you know, be on, get on the front line and, and make an impact and make a difference. And this is for all of us who have experienced trauma, you know, young, old, who knows what it feels like to have your spirit leave you, maybe entirely or even just pieces of it. You know, um, let's call our spirits back right now. This is the first time in a decade the National Indian Education Association has had student days. The team has very much supported student days and just seeing the other partners come in and help makes me feel good that you know this was the right decision, the right time to do this. Julian Guerrero Jr. was a keynote speaker. I hope to leave with you a message that we are ultimately as a collective designers defenders of tribal sovereignty. Four resolutions were passed, including one supporting teaching the full and accurate account of the United States. In Omaha, Nebraska, Shirley Snavy, Indian Country Today. Robin Butterfield, former chair of the National Indian Education Association, joins us. One of the resolutions addresses critical race theory. It's in support of teaching the full and accurate history in the United States. And it's the result of one of our staff members has uh, done a research on how many states have been passing legislation. And as of July 15th, 26 states have introduced bills or taken steps to restrict instruction of the full and accurate history of the United States and to limit discussions of racism, sexism um, in the classroom. And um, we just, um, got a notice yesterday that the ACLU of Oklahoma um, is 
passing a um, filing a lawsuit, I should say, challenging one of those states, which is Oklahoma. Um, it's um, House Bill 1775, which severely restricts public school teachers and students from learning and talking about race and gender in the classroom. And um, the director of the Oklahoma ACLU has said this, and it's a quote, education is a tool of empowerment put to its highest use when teachers and students are afforded the full scope of their constitutional rights to engage in comprehensive, meaningful, and sometimes difficult conversations. House Bill 1775 is a direct affront to the constitutional rights of teachers and students across Oklahoma by restricting conversations about race and gender at all levels of education. We bring this case to vindicate the rights of Oklahoma teachers and students and to protect the integrity of our educational institutions. That was Robin Butterfield from the National Indian Education Association. When we come back, David Wilson speaks about natives and health research and October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. David Wilson is the first director of the Tribal Health Research Office at the National Institutes of Health. Since 2017, he has addressed tribal leaders about their concerns. He also teaches at the Center for American Indian Health at John Hopkins University. I asked him about his work. Early stages uh, after our consultation, we were able to work out parameters for other tribal communities to want to participate in some of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine clinical trials that were launched. And we had great success in that. Some of the things that came out of this were groundbreaking data sharing and biological specimens agreements. They were created between tribal communities and COVID-19 pharmaceutical companies, which really allowed the tribal communities to wanna participate, but not only participate, to conduct COVID-19 clinical trials in their own communities in a respectful and culturally appropriate way. Besides COVID-19 research, what studies are you working on? Across the NIH, we are really preparing for what comes after the pandemic. Um, because of isolation, we've heard uh, and we've seen a lot in our communities what isolation has done. And so there's going to be a wave of issues related to mental health conditions. Um, we're already seeing a, raise, a rise in um, issues related to suicide and also substance misuse. So these are all really important factors that um, really are detrimental to our communities. So it's important to better understand how we can treat members of our community to address these conditions so that we can have better communities across the country. That was David Wilson, Director of the Tribal Health Research Office at the National Institutes of Health. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and this week, the American Indian Cancer Foundation celebrated Indigenous Pink. Its CEO, Melissa Buffalo, joins us. The goal of Indigenous Pink is to really raise awareness of the Indigenous cancer burdens and to uplift the voices of our community and celebrate the strength and resiliency um, of breast cancer survivors everywhere. Um, and so Indigenous Pink really has three aims to educate our community on the risks associated with breast cancer. Um, and then what are those ways that we can prevent breast cancer, such as breastfeeding, regular mammograms, you know, regular breast exams, exercising, limiting alcohol use and maintaining a healthy weight. And so also to raise awareness on the breast cancer incidence and mortality disparities among our American Indian and Alaska Native communities. You know, we also want to educate tribal and urban communities on the importance of breast cancer screenings because we know breast cancer are that cancer screenings are preventative for our women and our men. And we do this through culturally tailored tools and resources that really reflect the communities that we work with. Um, and lastly, just to, you know, hope that there's an increase in cancer screenings through this campaign. That was Melissa Buffalo from the American Indian Cancer Foundation. 
Stevie Salas was a boy growing up in Oceanside, California, dreaming of becoming a rock and roll musician. In the late 1980s, he made that dream come true. The father of funkadelic music, George Clinton, discovered Solace, and the rest is history. He's played on more than 70 albums and sold more than 2 million records. Solace has played with such legends as Rod Stewart, Mick Jagger, and Justin Timberlake, just to name a few. He's been named by Guitar Playing Magazine as one of the top 50 guitarists of all time. Mark Trahant interviewed him about his career. I look back at my life and I realize that Maybe there are no mistakes and they, everything happens for a reason. And when I met George Clinton, I, I was actually homeless. I moved to LA. I, I had a really popular band in San Diego and I moved to LA to try to make it in January of 1985. But by August, I was homeless. I was sleeping on a couch at a recording studio in August uh, of 1985. And George Clinton was working in that studio and I'd go up to every musician. I went up to the guys in Kiss. I went up to all these people and say, hey, I'm Stevie Solace. I play guitar and they'd tell me to beat it. And then I said it to George Clinton and he goes, oh, okay. That's all he said was, oh, okay. And about three o'clock in the morning, David Spradley, who he did Atomic Dog with, came in and, and woke me up and said, hey, you want to come in and try some guitar on this track? And I was just like, yeah. And I went in and I went crazy and George loved me. And the next thing you know, I was his sidekick. And then I met Bootsy Collins and Don Was and Thomas Dolby and my whole life changed with, with, with a blink of an eye. Solace tells us how he learned about indigenous music and the documentary that followed. I've always been a Native American. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like a new thing. And so I had this thing where I would go and I talked about it in Rumble where where I was <laughs> in LA just jamming and out of my mind you know movie stars and rock stars and playboy centerfolds and all my the madness that you think you want in life when you're a kid and Randy Castillo from Ozzy Osbourne from his letter Pueblo grabbed me and he goes hey you know him and I were going to London for this thing that we were playing on and he says you're coming with me to Indian country and he and he took me to Taos and that just settled me right down it was like I was able to find some type of balance in Taos. I don't know why, but the boys there, and we had a little, we played music. And, and I'd always go back to New Mexico to Indian country to settle down. And then I'd go back out in the world and to the madness of the world. And so around 2000, I was done with music. I'm, I want to retire. I'm going to do my last gig, which is going to be the Fuji Rock Festival. I'm one of the headliners with Rage Against the Machine in Japan. And I'm, I'm done. This is going to be my last gig. I'm over it. I want to go surfing in Costa Rica and I, and that's it. And I thought to myself, um, I got a phone call to open for the Rolling Stones in Canada. And I met a guy called Brian Wright McLeod, who was writing the encyclopedia of Native American music in complete entirety, all the way back to 1908 and wax cylinders. And he wanted me in his book. And he started turning me on to like, I didn't know Link Ray was a Native American. I didn't know Jesse Ed Davis. I was playing Jesse Ed Davis guitar parts with Rod Stewart and didn't know Jesse Ed Davis was a Native American. And I thought, you know, people need to know about these guys because we have role models here that have done amazing things and they're not from 150 years ago. So I thought, you know, I have to do something to give back, you know? So it was around 2000 now, 2001. And I start to, to think maybe I'll make a coffee book with talking about these amazing Native American musicians. Um, you know, I don't know. And then I met Tim Johnson from the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. I was giving a speech. We were building a recording studio in Six Nations and and I told him that I go, you know, around the world, I find that everyone wants to get one Native American into the mainstream. That's what we're trying to do. And I said, you guys got it all wrong. Let's bring the mainstream to Native America because they love us everywhere in the world. They want to know more about us. And, and Tim Johnson thought that was a fantastic concept. And so next thing I know, I took a job at the Smithsonian with him and I started creating the exhibit with him. He, he, he facilitated and put me with a staff and, and let me do what became Rumble. And we first did it at the Smithsonian and flushed it all out. And that's how Rumble happened. It was my way of giving something back. And it was also supposed to just be a simple, small film for PBS that was going to um, inspire indigenous people to know that they could do anything they wanted in this world because it's been done. There it is right there against all odds. And, and it just ended up changing the world. Rumble came out and it's, it's like I speak at Notre Dame University. It's changed the world. That was guitarist Stevie Salas. Let's take a look at Rumble, the Indians who rocked the world. There was a song came on the radio, a guitar instrumental, and it changed everything. Link Ray, it's rock and roll. Rumble. Yeah. 
That's the one. Rumble. Hey, Rumble. Rumble had the power to help me say, it. I'm going to be a musician. And then I found out that he was an Indian. The music that we know here in the United States is fully supported by input from Native and Indigenous people. Mr. Randy Casillo! Randy had become one of the most influential heavy metal drummers in the world. This is Jesse Ed Davis. I particularly fell in love with Jesse Evan Davis. He was with Taj Mahal, and Taj's album is what spurred me to rock more. And here's your rockin' chair lady, Mildred Bailey. From 16 to 20 years old, that's the only thing I listened to was Mildred Bailey. I just said, I want to learn how to sing like her. Figuring out that these people were Indians, and then we started to ask ourselves, why didn't anyone else know that? There was this key expression, be proud you're an Indian, but be careful who you tell. All of a sudden, I was talking about Native American issues and big time television. And all of a sudden, everything disappeared. From Charlie Patton to Link Gray, Robbie Robinson invented the genre. Jimi Hendrix is the best in his field. Jesse Ed Davis, everybody wanted him. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news and updates, visit us anytime at IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.